But once again, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this morning's MedTech series. And to kick things off this morning is Dean Miller, PAX President and CEO. Dean? Good morning, everyone. Sorry for that couple minute delay. Um, we'll blame the weather in the Midwest, which we don't have, thankfully. Um, I'm Dean Miller, the President and CEO of PACT, and I want to welcome you to our MedTech series. Um, we've got a great conversation happening this morning. My product is approved, now what? Um, you, you think that it's just that your product needs to be approved, but we're going to dive in deep on this conversation. And uh, as always, we're grateful uh, for a number of um, supporters. Um, uh, certainly uh, within um, uh, this series, uh, we have uh, several sponsors, including Baker Tilly, Dwayne Morris, Fox Rothschild, and the Science Center, all organizations really dedicated to the med tech space with special uh, specialty um, and individuals that really understand and know that. So we hope uh, that you look to partner with them. And if you need connections to them, please do let us know. Um, we are in a webinar, um, which means you're on mute, you're off screen, but you can ask questions. So please use uh, the Q&A box to do that. We will monitor that throughout. The panel will go to about 9.35, and then we're going to dive into Q&A after that. And with that, I would like to welcome and introduce our panel, and specifically uh, introduce our moderator. Charles DiNardo is the former president of Act, um, Ask Klopp. I know I'm going to butcher that. Um, and he is joined uh, by a tremendous panel of experts that he is going to introduce. Welcome, Charles. Well, thank you very much, Dean. Uh, let me start off by saying good morning to everybody. Welcome to the MedTech panel. Brief background on myself, as you've heard, I've been in the healthcare industry for over 25 years. Most recently served as president of Esculap, a $385 million med device company. We were primarily providing products and solutions into the operating room. Purposes of this discussion, what I think is important is our call points were the GPOs, IDNs, independent hospitals, ambulatory surgery centers, and of course, surgeon providers, because our products were surgical instruments, neuro, spine, and orthopedic segments. Uh, I love this topic for today. My product is approved, now what? I, I think as leaders in an organization from the inception of your idea, you worry about commercialization just because of the challenges in the US marketplace of bringing innovative technology to hospitals. And, uh, as we'll talk about today, you have the complexity of the sales channel, you have the number of stakeholders involved in the decision making process, the reimbursement landscape, how do you position your clinical data, and then in certain segments you have some dominant players that you need to navigate around. However, I would say from a macro perspective, I always believe that if you, if you had an innovative product that improved patient outcomes, it was cost effective, you could win in this market and, and the great news is the panel we have today. We have expertise across industry, the provider space, and even the vantage point from GPO. So I, I think with this group and team together, we'll be able to talk about you know, best practices and guidance so that you can be successful in launching a product. So with that soliloquy to start off, I'll just hand it off maybe to Deborah to introduce herself, and then we'll move from there. Thank you, and good morning. I'm Deborah Roy, and I'm a principal at Visient, which is a, a large very large group purchasing organization. I'm a nurse by education and I am, I sit on the advisory side of the uh, GPO. So what my role is at Vizian is I have value analysis uh, resources that all report up to me. We work with our members across the country to either align them with uh, best practices in their value analysis program, set up a value analysis program, bring them a little larger into the space through clinical supply integration. And at the same time, really wanting them to, to know how to provide the best value for the best for their patients um, and with the best outcome. So we always remember that at the end of every device, there's the patient. And we wanna make sure that, that um, when the decisions are made, that everyone is aware of that. So thank you for joining us today and we look forward to the discussion. Terrific. Sarah, would you like to go next? Yeah, hi, morning, everybody. Um, my name is Sarah Sahinas. I'm the Chief Sales Officer for Trice Medical. Uh, Trice Medical, we are an orthopedic, minimally invasive surgical device company. 
Um, so we very much specialize in um, innovative new products. So we, we have disruptive technology. So this is particularly pertinent for us trying to get new technologies into uh, facilities where we're a lot of the time we're doing, we're, we're kind of first in the market. So we need to be extremely prepared when it comes to value analysis committees to have all the, as, as much data as we can and really demonstrate our cost benefits. So it's, it's something that um, we, we have with our sales force, um, a lot of focus on and, and navigating the system. So a lot of experience trying to get through this, the, the process. Um, so really looking forward to the discussions today. Terrific. Chris? Oh, I think you might be muted. I promise you're gonna to wanna to hear Chris's background. You know what, why don't we go to Paula and then we'll- There you go, I got it, I got oh, it. Okay. I'm sorry, I couldn't get off mute. Hi, oh. I'm sorry, everyone. Good morning. Um, Chris Vanello, I'm the Director of Clinical Integration and Strategy for Rothman Orthopedics. That includes all our strategy and expanding markets with our health system partners. I also um, start with any of our new joint ventures for ambulatory surgery centers. I developed that with the uh, healthcare systems. I also uh, work with the systems to uh, develop OR efficiencies. And a lot of you probably on the call know, you know, we have a Rothman process for how we deliver um, orthopedic care in the operating room. So they're my main uh, strategies for Rothman. Terrific. And then Paula? Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Paula Solopaka. I'm the administrator of Jefferson Surgery Center, as well as the group vice president for New Health that oversees in the uh, facilities of Rothman partnership with New Health and um, with Mainline Health as well, as well as Jefferson University. I um, am very much involved in the everyday operations of the Navy Yard, as well as the financial and the partnership um, with a lot to, to do with the supply value analysis and a lot of the um, everyday challenges that we are facing with economics today. That's been one of my major focuses here um, with Rothman New Health and our main hospital partners. Thank you for having me. Terrific. So, and we encourage if you have questions, certainly we'll have time at the end, but you can sort of put them in the ch chat as well. Let's start off with the most pertinent question, which is from each of your perspectives, what is the best practice of getting new innovative products into a hospital? And I'd say as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And maybe we'll start on the provider side and then move to uh, GPOs and then to industry. So Paula or Chris, would you like to start with your uh, response to that question? Yes, I, I think I, I can definitely um, answer for, for us here best and most efficient way is to get the product into the facility is to be in, to have an active surgeon and physicians to back the product. Um, ensure the product is conducive in specialties performed in the facility. And, and the most important thing is to respect the supply value analysis process and ensure um, to be to have the most aggressive pricing. Um, and also for us is we, we're very involved in any of the new product line that comes to the facility is to trial and to have that feedback from the surgeons. Um, for us, it has worked. Um, the feedback from the physicians for us is very, um, it impacts the product um, that we're trying to bring into the facility. And I think that's the best for an outpatient ASC. So physician involvement for me and to partner up with them is probably the best way to, to go. Chris, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Paula. We also, from the practice side and the health system side, you know, I'm very involved with that, with the, with the hospitals and the ASCs that we partner with. I think you need to educate yourself on the process because unfortunately the process, approval process is different at all hospitals, all ASCs especially in, even in the same health system, it could be a different process. So find out what the right uh, avenue is to get these products approved. Make friends. 
That makes sense. So I hear from the provider side, we're talking about surgeon involvement early, right? You need to have an effective trial and you have to understand the process. So it sounds like the initial decision maker is the surgeon. If I move over to the Vizient, Deborah, what, what's your thoughts on bringing innovative product from a GPO perspective down? Uh, so I work mostly with the acute care side. So I'm in hospitals all day long. And I think the most important thing out of the gate is that anyone that is looking to bring a new product in has to understand a lot of things. They have to know their customer. Uh, Chris just said that every hospital is different. I always say I walk into one hospital, I've been in one hospital, and that's really the truth. Even within a system, hospitals can uh, have different ways of making clinical decisions. Uh, we try to organize them to be more systemized, to have a centralized clinical decision, but still some things happen outside of that. And you, you need to be aware of how that happens. Uh, you should know your providers. Who are those physicians and what are the procedures that they're actually performing? So it's important to understand that you can't just go to a clinician on a floor and expect to get your product in. Um, anywhere that we have them or that we encourage and most hospitals now have some kind of a value analysis process in place. And you have to be extremely aware of what that process is. You cannot just go to a clinician and expect that you can bring a product in. Usually there's some guardrails. Uh, typically that starts in supply chain, hopefully with a value analysis resource or manager. And that's really where your discussion should be starting. <clears throat> um, we know that by the time it gets onto an agenda for value analysis, if you don't have what we call a true champion, and Chris and Paul alluded to physician champions, which are extremely important. But what we like to talk about are true champions, because we know that, and I was the sales rep at one point in my life, and I know what happens. Um, sometimes they get a uh, conversation starts at the scrub sink, or it starts in their office. However, if they are not a true champion, if they do not come to the value analysis meeting, and in person, present the idea, present the product, be willing to speak to it, it doesn't get onto an agenda. And that is really best practice in the acute care side. So look for a true champion, not just somebody that is gonna say yes, make sure that they're aware of the processes that they need to go through within their organization so that they can actually help you to make that runway a little bit shorter for you. Really insightful. Now, if we move to the industry side, Sarah, your approach uh, to that answer or that question? Yeah, I very much echo um, what the providers have said. I mean, knowing the process is, is key, understanding that process from the beginning, um, knowing who to approach um, and, and having obviously the the, the end user advocating that that is absolutely key we, we we're not successful in these processes if we haven't got someone really advocating the product and getting involved in um in, in really driving it forward from the industry side what we do to try and prep um for, for going through a value analysis committee for every single product we have we we have what we call a, a backpack so we uh, we have a, a, a folder that's available to the whole of the sales force that has all the information that you may need for a VAC process. So within that VAC pack for every product, it's got the, the, the product IFU, the um, product brochure, any related clinical data, um, regulatory approval information, such as a 510k summary. So we have that all ready to go. Um, on top of that, we um, encourage our, our local reps to work with the physician to, to um, ha have a kind of a overarching letter that encompasses the the cost, the overall benefits, the cost, the clinical benefits. So a summary letter, and then if we need to attach the further documents from the backpack, that that will follow. So it's ultimately really important that we have all that information to hand, um, and that if we have any questions that come back, we respond quickly and we're able to provide any any relevant information. Thank you. That's really helpful. Maybe just go back. Um... I was going to go to our next question, but I want to go back because two things came up. One, we're hearing from the panel that each hospital has a different process, it sounds like, to get your product approved. So from an industry side, how do you figure out what the process is in an institution to make sure you're taking the right steps to get there if they're each different? Who do you call on to do that? That'd be interesting. I don't know. 
open that up to the group themselves to say, how do you start to learn the process so you do it in the right order? Who would like to take that first? So this is Deborah. I can start from the acute care side. Uh, ask questions. Um, you're, you are probably, as a um, someone who would like to get your device into a hospital, you're going to have to start somewhere. And you may decide, well, I'll start in the cath lab. Well, if you can get an appointment into the cath lab, what you need to do is start asking questions. What is the process for clinical decision making here at your hospital? How do I best get my products in? Because it could fall into a black hole. You may feel that you've had a great conversation with somebody in the cath lab, but they don't push it any further because maybe they don't. Um, they're just trying to have a nice conversation with you and, and they don't necessarily believe that this is a product that's going to be able to move through their organization. But I, I would encourage you to just have a lot of really good, solid conversations. Ask them outright, how are clinical decisions made at this hospital? What do I need to know as a vendor? What do I need to understand? Who do I need to go to first? And those folks will help direct you. Uh, a lot of times, again, you may start in supply chain, go down, sign, is, sign in as a vendor rep, believe that you're, you're going to the right place, but every organization has some kind of guardrails around vendors coming in. And you need to understand that as well. That's so important. Um, <clears throat> it may take two or three meetings with the right person before you get to the right folks that can help drive your uh, product through the process. So don't um, don't hesitate to keep going back and asking more and more questions. That's the way that you're going to learn your organizations. And when we say that hospitals are different, if you take a large IDN, it could be that some of the smaller hospitals within, within that IDN are making decisions just a little bit different because of the procedures that they're performing. So earlier I said, know your organizations, know the procedures, know the physicians that are attached to those procedures that's gonna really help you start conversations and getting into the hospitals. Very good. I apologize, I lost my picture here. I will get it back, but if we, um, that question going to either, uh, maybe Paula, well, how do you learn the process at, at Jefferson to make sure that you're taking the right approach to get your product in there? So for, for us, I would definitely say involve the administrator and your materials manager. Um, the communications already started. If the physician wants the product um, and would like to utilize the product, I know the materials manager is definitely going to be in the know already. Um, but the administrator needs to be involved um, because when we do bring it to our supply value meeting, the medical director is is present at that at that meeting, and um, we need to gather all the information to present it to the supply value analysis meeting, and then a determination and, and the approval process happens there. Interesting. And then Sarah, from an, uh, from a industry standpoint, it sounds like you have this backpack put together. How else do you help your sales force understand the process they need to undertake? So, I mean, it's the same thing. Every, we touched on it, every facility has a different process. So we encourage our team that you, you need to understand that process. Don't assume it is the same process for every different facility. You have to understand that. So we, we do a lot of training to try and help navigate them through that. Um, and, and, and exactly as you know, uh, Deborah and Paula said, you need to ask a lot of questions. So you have to get in there, ask, and, it, and it's not just the physicians, you've got to ask the administrators, the OR manager, you know, figure out exactly who all the stakeholders are, just ask a lot of questions about the process um, and, and make sure you're following the process. Don't, you know, from our side, it's so important we don't try and kind of sneak the product in without going through the official channels, because that's very difficult to come back from and you lose credibility. So it's really important that we, we understand that early on. That's really good. So uh, again, I apologize. I'm having some difficulties, but I assume everybody can hear me here. If we stay on this, what, what really happens in a value analysis committee? You know, we talked about tips or tricks, but what's the discussion look like? What's the committee looking for? If you're going to be at a higher price point, do you have to position your product differently? Um, so maybe some insights you have on what occurs at the value analysis committee and what can we do to make sure we're successful when we have the opportunity to get there. I hear one thing, you need a champion there, but what else is going into that decision-making process? And uh, again, maybe we'll start with, uh, you wanna start with you, Deborah? Sure, um, it's a process. And uh, 
What it starts with typically is a new product request. So a new product request is a formal request that comes through a champion, a clinician. Typically we don't uh, suggest that it come directly from the vendor. It really needs to come from somebody who's gonna champion through the process. So the new product request has a lot of different information that is gathered, that needs to be gathered, not just from a financial perspective, but from an inventory, a logistics perspective, a clinical outcome perspective. What are you using now? What's the volume? What are the price points? Uh, that new product request, for the most part, we ask, always is filled out by the requesting clinician. Uh, that can be difficult, uh, but typically if it becomes a difficulty, um, the value analysis manager will work directly with that clinician to get that information. A lot of organizations have software platforms where you can, um, where that information just goes right through a software platform and then it starts that process. Once that new product request becomes um, live, uh, it goes right to the value analysis manager or whoever is maintaining this in the supply chain world if they don't happen to have a, a supply chain manager. All of the information has to be uh, filled out on it. It has to be complete. Many times you go to finance, what's the reimbursement on this is if it's an implantable device and it, it has a reimbursement tied to it, you find out all of that information, is there any evidence? Um, Sarah alluded to the VAC pack, which are really important, but in the acute care side, what we also look for is not just information from the vendor and the supplier about that product, but what's the evidence out there? What's the clinical evidence? What are the peers talking about? So that you have um, evidence that's outside of just the information from the manufacturer. That's super important. And on the acute mm -hmm. care side, it's extremely important to the physicians. If you have referral physicians that you know of that have used this product somewhere within your region, really important to get that information. And this is all before it hits the value analysis committee. Once you have all this information, it's tight, the value analysis manager in the hospital, can then put it onto the agenda. Typically, this takes about almost four to six weeks before it even hits an agenda because it takes that long sometimes to gather all the information. Have it be clean, have it be clear. Know that you can get that provider, the physician or the nurse to the meeting to say, we will champion this and we will talk about it. So once it hits the value analysis committee meeting, you have that person that comes to the meeting and will present that product for you. Typically at that time, there's a vote. Is it a vote for an evaluation? Is it a vote that we can move forward on this? Is it a vote that, you know, we really don't need it because we have a like product that is very doable. What we're using right now seems to work and it's a like product. So we go, it can go in a lot of different places from there. Um, and that's all the outcomes of the, of the committee meeting. We're hoping that decisions can be made within at least one, if not two committee meetings. And that's the importance of having all that information up front. If it goes to an evaluation, we set a timeline on that. Is it six weeks? Is it nine weeks? How many devices are they gonna be using? so that we can have some kind of a um, guardrail around the timeline on this so it doesn't get strung out. The one thing that we know that providers are very, uh, probably frustrates them the, the most is the runway for getting a product request in. And we also, through that committee meeting, have a lot of education of the providers at that time because a lot of them also feel that once a decision is made, the next day the device is going to show up. Well, that doesn't happen. You know, there could be products that have to be run through. There could be logistics. There could be distribution issues. They have to get it into the MMIS system. There's a lot of different variables surrounding that. Um, so, you know, at this point, you're also wanting to understand how many devices may be 
they're using, how many procedures are they going to be using. You set timelines on that, you set guardrails around that, and you do follow-ups with them, maybe in another committee meeting. So again, hopefully one to two committee meetings, you have some kind of an answer, um, but it could be a couple month process. And for some organizations, it's even longer than that, if they're not organized enough to have all the right information at the right time. So kind of a long answer. No, very helpful. Um, but, but from the acute side, you know, we really are very intentional, very methodical on how they're making the decisions. And, you know, we have a vendor form that we, uh, a value analysis committee or resource manager will send out to the vendor when they get the new request. And to Sarah's point, there's a lot of good information from what it sounds like she has in her pack, but the we have things also such as education who has to be educated is going to be outside of just you know the the periop area is the ed going to be using this product what do they know need to know about it um there's a lot of probably um we have about 30 to 40 components and elements that have to be answered from the from the vendor side before we can even get it onto that committee meeting so maybe I, I saw Paula sort of nodding affirmatively, maybe some additional insight that you might have on the value analysis committee. And then in particular, can one surgeon carry the day to get an innovative product in, or does the value analysis committee want to see that the products use more broadly across your institution? So maybe your thoughts on the value analysis committee and that specific question. So specifically for an ASC, I think first, Deborah, a lot, um, you know, we replicate a lot within acute care, but not that extensive. Um, I think um, for physicians and for the ASC setting, um, we're able to gather all of that data and information um, in a uh, timely matter where I don't think it's that um, extended. Um, we make that decision probably at the one supply value analysis meeting that we have, because then we put out the plan of, Let's do the trial. After the trial, if it gets approved by the committee, after the committee, then we're doing the education for the staff that it affects and, and, and so on. And, and I think that's the component that I think we differ a little bit, but we still have that in a smaller frame um, than what an acute care hospital is, is doing. So at is there anything yeah. I feel that the physician, the physician involvement and how many physicians will be using this product will be determined by the trial and looking at the financial component. And at the end of the day, we that's our responsibility. We need to see how that affects and what's our current product compared to what the new product is that we're trying to bring in. Chris, just to add to that on the acute care side, we. When, when you look at volumes, you look at where the departments are that are using that. So if it's different physicians, uh, it can very, very much be different physicians. And that's part of the due diligence that has to happen when you are deciding on how um, and who is going to bring this to the organization. So you have to be very aware of that. And it, many times, and I think differing from an, um, an ASC, there's different committees. There's a periop committee, there's a cardiology committee, there's a nursing committee. There could be upwards, I've seen upwards of 13, 14 different value analysis committees. I don't profess that, that to be efficient, but it happens. Um, so everyone has to be aware. So that communication component in an acute side, probably from the ASC is probably a lot different. I yes. think it has some of the sameness to it, but it's probably so different from the acute care side. Just and and for, the, for the ASC, I think it's more of the specialty component mm -hmm. uh, versus all physicians utilizing. So if you're looking at shoulder and elbow versus foot and ankle, so what specialty are you affecting? How many of those physicians do you have? And how many are willing to utilize this product and have to be involved in the, in the uh, trial component to see if it's beneficial for the facility and the physicians utilizing it? A follow on question. I'll open up the group here. So, how do you avoid the value analysis committee if you have a product <laughs> that you're going to say is not necessarily innovative? <laughs> I, but just for a minute, to, to 
It may be by saying it's so innovative, then you go through this value and analysis committee, which I don't want to say is a black box, but certainly a lot of things occur that are outside the control of industry and industry likes to control things. Is there a way to work around the value al analysis committee? Maybe if it's a commoditized product or otherwise, or everything goes through it and you really don't want to try to work around the value analysis committee. I'll open that up just generally. And if you say that's a bad question, we'll move on to the next one. I don't so, want to well, feel that they can circumvent. I'm sorry, go ahead, Chris. <laughs> that's okay. I don't think you can work around it unless it's a pilot. Um, you know, as long as it's FDA approved, I mean, it's very difficult to work around, I think, the value analysis process. Okay. I, I, that's my opinion. We educate that anything and everything goes to the value analysis. Yeah, I mean, we have a it, we have yeah. a committee, we have a structure. It should actually not deviate from what we currently have in place, so it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and Chuck, just to add before we get off of this question, yeah. um, <laughs> ease of implementation is a huge issue, right? How this is going to affect the patient from a cost standpoint. And, you know, is it difficult, you know, a lot of patient engagement platforms, you know, I'm not even talking about industry now, you know, it's difficult for patients. Is it going to cost the money? Is this covered by insurance is a huge thing for Rothman. Um, we don't like out of network. We don't like to pay out of pocket. We don't want the patient paying out of pocket. And then remember, you'll get it in, but is it sustainable? Mm -hmm. You know, I'll use the example of a robot, not against robots, you know, but the OR nurses don't necessarily like the robot. They feel it slows their day down. So if it's slowing the staff's workflow or changing it, that could be, you know, an issue too, to sell your products. And I think, you know, Sarah, you could probably attest to any, you know, having those difficulties. You got to get the staff's buy-in too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, and actually on, on that note, um, while we're on that topic, in terms of getting the staff's buy-in, how's that reflected in the value analysis committee the process of that so getting the staff feedback being important how, how are you capturing that in part of the process Paula I'll, I'll defer to you but I don't see that I don't see, a lot in value yeah analysis. I don't I you know the way I'm looking at it is I don't have their feedback um because again we're in the midst of investigating trialing and doing all of the um and if this is a product that a physician and the committee has decided then we go ahead and have a responsibility to educate our staff. But I don't, I, you know, that's not one of the things that I do is provide the feedback. If it's a product that the, the, you know, OR nurses are utilizing, it's a different story. Then that's a product that I'm going to involve them and get their feedback. But if this is a physician um, product, then no, I won't, I wouldn't go through that route. So on the acute side, each of the committees are made up of cross-functional folks. So it's physicians, it's clinicians. We certainly take the advice of nursing staff as well um, because they are typically part of that procedure. Um, but we also put guardrails in for, um, you know, a lot of times we'll hear from a physician, you know, I'm gonna do 50 of these procedures. And maybe six months down the line, there's 49 devices still sitting on the shelf, which is only causing waste in the organization. So there's a process for speaking to that variation and what happened. And that same champion who had to provide the information of why they want it in now has to provide the information and why there's a variation. So it's, I think the, um, I, I do believe that nurses have a, have very much a, a say on the acute care side in what's happening. It could be that it's, it's, it's obviously more so from the ASC side, but um, you do want to involve all participants within that um, service line. So Chris, you brought up a really interesting point. If, if we change the top to say, instead of I have a new product, my product was approved, now what? My product made it through the value analysis committee what does it so we celebrate what does industry need to do now because if it's not sustainable it sounds like you've done a whole lot of work a surgeon might use it for a short period of time there's product on the shelf and then all that work doesn't result in incremental sales and return on investment so now we get to day two we celebrated the value analysis committee we worked through it what does industry need to do at that point to make sure it's sustainable in the institution? And I'll start with you, Chris, since you brought up the point, and then maybe we can move around the table on that one as well. 
Oh, I think you're muted. Sorry. Uh, yeah, they should they should support the product for an extended period of time. That's very helpful for an administrator. For someone like me, when the surgeon calls me and says, uh, I haven't seen the, the, the rep, in, you know, they dropped this product off and now I haven't seen them, you know, or we don't know how to use it. We need help. We need support. I think that's a big, um, the big companies do it well. You know, they're there to support you, but you really have to be there and support the staff, especially I feel the nursing staff, if it's an OR product. Absolutely. Education and having the rep present during the cases that are scheduled is a big, big um, yeah. expectation I think I have. And that's a discussion that I have with the rep um, when we approve a any product. Um, and it's documented education. So, yeah. And then Sarah, how do you ensure that that happens? You have that continuity of the training, the education on the industry side, especially when the sales aren't there initially, maybe they're lower sales volume. How do you keep the attention of the sales rep and marketing into the institution? Yeah, so, I mean, on our side, I mean, they are products that, you know, need some level of training, you know, with the staff as well as the surgeons. So, so they, they have to be there, at least for those first initial cases to, to get everyone trained. The then ongoing, making sure there's ongoing support once the initial training has been done, that's more of the challenge. Like, how do we make sure we're, we're providing enough, but not being in there too frequently? So that's where it's, you know, we try and encourage our reps to, to make sure that with our um, our customers that are using our products, there is a regular check-in point that they are, you know, even if they're not seeing them, and, and we're obviously a, a small company, so we have fewer reps to actually reach customers, even if they're not physically present, at least checking in, giving them a call or giving the staff a call and making sure that, you know, things are still okay. Do they need anything? Do they need an additional support? Our, our internal customer service team are obviously very key as well um, and make sure that, you know, we're um, answering any immediate questions and the customer service team are uh, working with the reps for any um, any needs that that come out and any inquiries from from any customer, especially obviously existing customers. That's really good. Um, so then maybe the, the next question is, you have a product that's innovative, you want to get a premium price. And, and I'm just assuming when you want to have a, a premium price in the marketplace, there might be additional scrutiny by the hospital because there's additional costs associated with it. What do you need to do to bring in that premium product into a hospital and be able to get a price that might be higher than your current price that's uh, for a, not a similar product, but a product that's certainly maybe the standard of care in your institution right now? What do you need to see there to get the higher pricing? Thoughts on that? Uh, on the acute care side, you need to have the evidence. You need to have the clinical evidence. You need to have it support clinical outcomes, positive clinical outcomes. And you need to know that. So as a, as a supplier of your product, you need to understand what, how am I impacting? How can I impact clinical outcomes? Do I decrease time in the, in the OR? Do I help prevent um, lengthy length of stays? What's the clinical outcomes? That's probably at this time, um, you know, there's so many products that come in that the price points, we work through the price points from a financial perspective, but Organizations now are looking beyond price and they're looking at quality of care and total cost of care. So if you can, if you know, and you can prove and you can show with good evidence how you can increase um, quality of care and impact the total cost of care, then you have a win. But if it's just from a financial perspective, it's a really hard discussion because there are a lot of like products out there and you also need to have a champion that can really articulate very, very well why this product is different. And that's where your, your education to your providers come in, which is important, and have them be able to articulate that. And it's backed up by evidence. Deborah, I, I agree for the ASC as well. Mm -hmm. I have one product in my head that I'm thinking that A, it financially cost us more mm -hmm. money. Um, but at the end, the result for me meant more than just what the financial component was. So yes, it's definitely quality um, and patient outcomes for the ASC as well. I agree. And good patient outcomes does equal financial success. There's no doubt about it. If you have bad quality, you're going to have bad, you know, bad financial results. So yes, definitely. But I think you know, it's going to be, it's tough right now to convince administrators like, okay, this is, this product is going to 
reduce complications, right? A complication when you get in these at-risk contracts with the payers is going to cost you a lot of money, right? And bad outcomes for your patient, bad reputation for your organization. And that that's that's where we're moving to. Yeah, and I, I agree. And um, so, some of the things we do on our side to really demonstrate that is um, through a budget, in, budget impact model. So we'll try where we have products that are at a higher price point, but can save all these surrounding costs like that you spoke about is trying to demonstrate it in a model where it's okay, th this is the cost of the product, but these are the surrounding cost savings that you can have in terms of reducing OR time. Um, and it, you know, if it's a disposable product versus a reusable product, sterilization costs and, and staff time, that type of thing. The, the challenge we have is making it relatable to every facility and finding a way that we can make the cost resonate because the, the challenge we have is it's, it's difficult to find someone who knows all of those costs within a facility that knows the cost of OR time, their, their sterilization costs. So we're giving you know average um, national data showing that, but then when it comes to actually relating that to the facility, that, that's a challenge from our side, finding somebody who knows those costs. So that's what we then try and do is find an administrator who, who has overarching um, visibility and control of those costs versus you know individual departments. And, and again, that varies facilities to facility and, it, and it's tough finding that person who generally you know, has, has responsibility for the full budget. Mm -hmm. From the acute care side, Sarah, it really starts in value analysis because they, they know who the contacts are and they know how to get that information. Um, the only other thing I wanted to add to this conversation, which um, is a really great one, is that if it creates a new service um, for an organization, uh, that's a different conversation as well. So even though the price points is a premium product, if it's truly different, if it's truly innovative, it could create a different service for the hospital. It could, which then allows them to bring in more revenue. Um, they can market a little bit differently and it could be an important um, component of, you know, your product sale. So again, it, you know, I can't emphasize enough in organizations in acute care, it does start in value analysis, but they're great at trying to direct you at where you need to go. And they'll recognize an innovative product and know, is this something that has to go, you know, through a clinical trial a department first? And is it truly something that's truly, truly innovative? And how do we deal with that? But they have that information for you. So if you're, if you can help direct your, your um, your sales folks to uh, the value analysis again. They they can they have loads of information and great contacts. And in in that relay through the physician champion is that is <clears throat> how they would ultimately we would get that information. Is that sort of what you're saying? Is that they would relay that information to the physician champion to then the supplier, or would you recommend? Is there a way the supplier could get that information directly? They can get it through supply chain. Okay. through the procurement office. Um, sometimes the physician knows, sometimes he doesn't or she doesn't. Um, I would start in the supply chain office and ask them, you know, who do you have a value analysis process? Who's that person? Who's your contact? And just start right there. Okay. So maybe a follow on question on that. And then I want to get to whether the, when you approach an ambulatory surgery center or an IDN, do you approach them differently? Do they have different value proposition looking for? Before we get to that, I'm not sure, Deborah, were you saying that, boy, if you have an innovative product, and I hate to put this up after the earlier discussion, robotics, you could see that the larger companies have robotics, and then they help the institution say, you should market your hospital as having robotics. You get additional patients in there. I think for smaller players, it's harder to, I don't want to say partner to position like that, but is the what's the approach to say, I have an innovative product and it will help you market the hospital so you can bring additional patients in. Is that something that resonates with institutions and is that something even smaller companies should explore in these discussions they're having with their uh, hospital customers? Thoughts on that? Uh, it sure does resonate. Um, but again, you go back to a comment I made very early on, you have to know your organization. And what are the, who are the physicians? What are the procedures they're, they are performing? What's their market? You know, are they um, acquiring a lot of organizations? What does that look like? You know, where do you fit in? Where would your product fit in? 
So you need to have a lot of upfront information and you get that only through a lot of conversations that you have within that organization. Um, but again, you go back to, it's gonna to have to be driven through someone in the organization. You have to start the conversation there. And any organization that uh, we have been in, I've been doing value analysis uh, education and consulting for about 20 years now. We always encourage hospitals, all the conversations have to start with you. If you're a value analysis manager, that's where it starts. And so going to an administrator probably is not the best route, um, at least from the acute care side, because they will direct you down to supply chain procurement and to those folks. So at Jefferson, how do you look at um, the ability to sort of market the product to bring patients in? Is that something that you focus attention on? So um, I would, uh, I'm considering a product that I brought in, it was a uro urology product. Um, and that's not something that we do a lot of. So I went ahead and um, branched it and um, marketed um, the product um, and worked real closely with the rep, um, was able to recruit an additional physician. So I took, a, I took out a product we didn't have before. I had one physician utilizing it. So I then went ahead and started to market. I was able to um, um, credential two additional providers. So the market came out to be beneficial um, for the actual product line. So yes, we do. So that is a, an interesting approach that can be taken if you have a truly innovative product that could draw patients into an institution, better clinical outcomes. And, um, then maybe the next question goes back to, and Paula, I'll start with you. So you're approaching an ambulatory surgery center as, uh, compared to acute or if you're approaching a GPO or an IDN, is your messaging different? So from an ambulatory surgery center compared to acute care, are you looking for something different than maybe acute care? Or do you start with something different? Are they more price sensitive than an acute care, for example? I think we're different but and similar in certain ways. Um, okay. So it depends. It depends on what um, your focus is for that, um, that component. Um, so Again, I think we are less extensive compared to an acute care setting. Um, but again, like what I what I did with my product, depending on what product you're trying to bring into the facility and what your what process it has to, I need physician I need physician buy-in. I need physicians who are going to champion. Um, it's going to be different in an acute care hospital. I worked acute care uh, 25 years ago. Um, Trying to bring a product in there was totally different compared to what I'm able to do here in an ASC. Um, my materials manager and I work very closely together to see how this would benefit not only the physician, the patient outcome, as well as the equity component. So you have so many different variables that happen, but at the same time, the hospital and the ASC, we still have similar things and processes that we have to get accomplished. But again, my focus could be different compared to an acute care hospital. Chris, your, your, your thoughts on that? You. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. I get an F for that. Um, <laughs> so from a marketing standpoint, you're asking me, Chuck, from a practice side? Yeah, so from a standpoint of, you know, when you're going to approach an ambulatory surgery center, maybe compared to acute care, are there different... Um, approaches you take from a marketing standpoint? Do you position it differently? Do you focus pricing first in ambulatory and maybe quality of care and acute? I'm making that up. Or is the approach the same from your perspective? I think it's the same. It depends on the organization like Deborah and I have been talking about. We work in, I think it's 76 facilities across four states and 15 of them we have some kind of investment or ownership in. So it's all different. And really it's a lot easier for us to get things through in our own facilities, right? Because Paul will tell you, they're investors. They're not going to um, buy something that's gonna cost the center unnecessary money, right? From a marketing standpoint, I think it's great, but sometimes I think the patient doesn't understand it. So it's minimally invasive, right? That might not apply to everyone. Not everyone might, it might they not, might not be a candidate for the robot. And I think that's a, that I, I've had talked to patients where that really upsets them. You know, so, I mean, I, we're very careful about that. And Paul knows that we, we really watch what we market 
and what the patient can understand. I think that's important. You know, Chris, Brent, you just brought up a great point on the investment that the providers have into the organization because some um, surgery centers, the hospital is still purchasing for them. Some mm -hmm. they purchase on their own. So you have to understand that model as well, because I will guarantee you that physicians who have a stake in the game in the ambulatory surgery center are a little bit more due diligent about price and knowing the price of a product than they mm -hmm. do in a hospital. I cannot tell you the organizations that I go through, go to where price is still not shared with physicians. And it's, it's right. mind boggling because they should be stewards of finance just as they are in their ambulatory surgery center. But sometimes that still does not happen. And there's a lot of times that it's very frustrating because a product that can be used in a hospital, they won't use in an ambulatory surgery and vice versa. So it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic when you have uh, surgery centers that you have to um, be aware of as well. Right, I agree. And keep in mind, mm -hmm. um, these patient, these centers, we're, we're shifting a lot of in, traditionally inpatient procedures mm -hmm. to Paula's ASC. That's right. And we're we're getting paid less money, right? Mm -hmm. And also, you worry about pushing the envelope too much with patients. You know, total mm -hmm. joint replacement, great. They're leaving that day. Mm -hmm. That's a big surgery. You know, I can. You know, but you're going to mm -hmm. see that shift, and I think industry needs. And I tell the big. Zimmer, Stryker, Arthrex, you guys have to figure that out because we're not going to, we cannot pay you what we've been paying you in a, an acute care setting, mm -hmm. right? We have to figure that out. They do. So if I ask this question, if, if you were a, a small company, even a, a larger one, bringing a new product to market, it, would there be a strategy where you start with an ambulatory surgery center because they'll make a decision more quickly. They might be more price conscious. You get the product in there. And then from there, you try to get it into the acute care facility through these physician champions. Is that a quicker pathway to build a market in the US, recognizing maybe inventory surgery centers have less volume? Or when you hear that from a provider side or a GPO side, would you say that that wouldn't be an approach you would take? Thoughts on that? And maybe we'll start with industry. Sarah, thoughts? Yeah, and, and, and we have honestly this discussion a lot. Like, oh, what, good. what should we be focusing um, on the, the hostels versus the ASCs? Um, and, you know, the, with the hospitals, you know, the challenge is exactly that. It's a much longer process. So we know that we're going to, you know, up front, there's a, a lot more heavy lifting to get through the value analysis, a lot more work involved in preparing for that. And then when we do, it's a much longer process. In the ASC, it's generally a shorter process, but then there are also... Um, more pricing pressures, exactly what Chris, you know, touched on. The reimbursement isn't as high, so therefore we, you know, do have to, you know, be more um, conscious of that when it comes to pricing. Um, and and also, you know, exactly what you know Paula touched on as well. It's the physicians have ownership, so you, you're having those conversations very early on in terms of the the pricing. They are much more aware of that, um, which again, you know, in terms of the pricing pressure, you're not going to get it through even to the the value analysis committee or, or the approval process if you haven't got the physician on board. Um, early on. So there is a benefit in that you are almost speeding up that process because you're having those conversations very early on and need to get them bought into um, the cost benefit. Um, but it's but it's 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 a in a way a more difficult sell because you have to get them really bought into the cost benefits and there's more pricing pressure. So there's pros and cons to both. And and a long, long answer um, to your question is ultimately we do both we are we absolutely go to hostels as well as ASCs um that there is no um one we try and prioritize over the other okay very one good. suggestion I would is what's the contribution margin on the cases right yeah. so if we buy a hundred and twenty five thousand dollar guardian table right Paula we're going through that now how many cases like you can't do five cases a year five hip scoops a year and mm. we'll net we won't make any money right and you, you you have a table that's just sitting there that costs one hundred twenty five thousand. So co cost uh, contribution margins would be helpful. Yeah. Deborah, any thoughts you have from approaching ambulatory surgery, or do you think there's the same oversight and process generally as in acute care or in hospitals, or or different? I think it depends on the device. I think it depends on the the nature of the procedure. Um, 
because that can be different. Um, it depends on the physicians that are involved. Um, I think Chris just made a great point on the contribution and that goes back to, you know, they may be using something in an ambulatory center. They want to bring it into the acute side and they say, you know, I will do 50 procedures in six months, 49 devices are still sitting on the, on the shelf. And why is that? Well, because we ended right. up doing them in our ambulatory center. Well, okay, but that's created now waste in the OR for us. And most often, not always, a lot of times, um, physicians are not as sensitive to that as they would be in their ambulatory setting. So, you know, it's conversations that we're having around that that's different. Um, so I would say that it's, it's just, it's gonna be variable depending on the device that you're bringing in. And so you, Deborah, you brought up a point earlier, I'll open up the group. How, um, how much information do surgeons have on cost of implants, margin they're making? It sounds like they have a sensitivity maybe in the ambulatory surgery center to the extent they might have an ownership interest in the matters, but on the acute care side, how much are the surgeons asking questions about pricing, margin, as compared to you know, just wanting the product from a clinical standpoint? They want to know, but you do. it depends on the organization. Some organizations aren't willing to share that information. Okay. Still. Some are, some are not. We encourage it. When we work up, you know, for instance, if you take a new implant, a new total joint that they want to bring in, what's the cost of the implant versus the procedure? So we, we take a look at that. We can, we can get that data for them, but can it be shared? Some organizations, it cannot be. I work with an organization right now where we cannot share any reimbursement information with the physicians. We're not allowed to. We know it. We go after it because we try to help them make great decisions. The physicians, do they want it? Yes, but we're being asked not to share it. So it depends on the organization. But we encourage um, things like there's a great organization I worked with once that had the price of every single product on a, on a sticky note to their, on their shelves. So the physician knew what the price of every single product was that they used. Two, you have organizations that they still don't know the price and they're shocked a lot of times to understand what the cost of products are. Yeah. Um, here at the Navy Yard, I do share um, everything mm. to the surgeons. That's great. Yeah. And I think you have to be consistent with your pricing and, in the industry. And they're, they're blown away. They're blown <laughs> away going, oh my God. Yeah. Yes. Really? That's so true. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with Chris. You, you have to be consistent and, and you have to rationalize your pricing as well. Like, there's nothing worse than, you know, someone's asking right. for the price and you're just throwing a number out there with no real thought into it. Um, it's, you know, it's gotta be thoughtful, it's gotta be reason for, for pricing. And if it's discounting, you know, we, we try and encourage our team, if it's a discount, there's a reason for it. Either it's it's, it's margins because of the reinvestment or it's because, you know, it's volume related. Mm -hmm. So right. we try and make sure that there's thinking behind it rather than just pulling out a random number. Right, and I'm sure Deborah, you probably see this all the time. I get charged a thousands of dollars more depending on the hospital compared to what we pay. I mean, it's not consistent and that needs to change. I think, um, you know, I just think that's a big issue when, especially someone like me that's working in four states and we're getting different pricing for our centers. Yeah, one thing people should know is that a, at a GPO, we have advantage of having data from yeah. hospitals all over the country. So we know what the pricing is um, and we can help to push out benchmark ranges for them to understand mm -hmm. what they should be paying. And that's a lot of what we work with with our members is, you know, you, your price index is pretty high. The price index is high if it's, you know, in the 70s, 80s and 90s, you wanna look at it as a golf score, you know, the lower, the better. And there are other organizations out there that are getting much better pricing than you are. So where do you want to sit? Do you want to sit at that 25th percentile, that 50th percentile? So it is important because they are aware. And there's a lot of times that we'll also do financial studies and we'll find that, um, you know, maybe there are seven hospitals in the system. They could all be getting different pricing. All of them could have gotten different pricing on a product. 
and we want to standardize that pricing. And sometimes that's kind of that low hanging fruit right out of the gate to be able to save dollars for an organization is just to right size their pricing. Yeah. And I, all, I agree. And I think we need to better understand discounting. Yeah. Because we don't know what we're getting. You know, I'm being told I get 20% off, but oh, I don't yeah. find that we're, that isn't really true yeah. because it, it's lower in Florida what we're paying. So there was no discount. So I think that's important. And that's why you have to be consistent. So we know we're really getting a discount mm -hmm. based on volume. I think that's really important on the industry side because you want to lose credibility as you start dealing mm -hmm. with groups if you have disparate pricing. And, and with pricing transparency now, just with the data, there is going to be more and more transparency. You better be able to yeah. justify different pricing. Before we move to questions, I just want to make sure we, for the audience, stakeholders. We talked about the importance of getting surgeons on board, the value analysis committee, the nurses. Is there other, are there other stakeholders as you're trying to get your product into the, into the hospital or ambulatory that you have to make sure that you approach and say, boy, don't forget about them or it could, you could get through the value analysis committee and still not have a product that you can sell into the hospital. We'll stick with hospitals for this. Are we missing anybody besides, you know, that I wrote down the nurses, surgeons, of course, the value analysis committee, I don't know, material management, is there other departments? Well, definitely material management. Um, sometimes risk needs to be involved, risk management has to be involved. Yeah. Um, infection control has to be involved, your safety has to be involved. You know, is, it, is there equipment involved that is gonna impact, um, you know, being brought into the hospital and how is that gonna impact? So your biomed department sometimes has to be involved in decisions like that. So within that committee, as I mentioned before, it's a really diverse value analysis committee. And all of those players typically are sitting on the committee to help make those decisions. So you have to have awareness of, of all of that education, nurse education, how is this going to get out and the information get out to the players. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's a long stream of um, cross functional folks within a hospital that have to be aware. Is it incumbent on industry to get to each of those stakeholders or do you just rely upon the value analysis committee and say, I'll focus on the surgeons, I'll focus on nursing, but then I'll let the value analysis committee mm -hmm. carry the day everywhere else. Or are there are a few that you say, you better go there directly if you wanna make sure you make through the, uh, the process. On the acute side, it's gonna be dependent on the hospital, whether they want you going or not, or whether they want just the information so right. that they can have those conversations. So, and sometimes they'll bring you into a conversation if they think that something is gonna be cumbersome, especially on a piece of equipment. Um, they will ask you probably to be in on those conversations, not at the committee, but before a committee meeting to have those conversations, but it depends on the organization. Um, I think it's hard to seek out all those different folks, but certainly if you start where you should be starting, they're gonna make you aware of who needs to be brought into the conversation. Well, with that, we have a, a number of questions in the chat. Maybe I'll start with the top one and we'll uh, see how many of these we can answer in the next 20 some minutes. Let's see. Um, other than a warm introduction, what are the best ways to get in touch with a physician who could be a champion for you in the system? Great question. So we started off, boy, we have a, a physician. Now what do we do? How do we get the attention of a physician as it relates to our products? Who would like to take that question? I can, take, I can start. I, I think there, that's a hard one, but it's a good question. Um, a lot of times I get calls from surgeons that were just at a meeting like the mm -hmm. national meetings, because Trice, maybe you had a booth there. Yeah, that's definitely, I think, a big one. You know, AUKUS, all the different, um, you know, professional meetings. Interesting. That's one, yeah. yeah. So trade shows, society meetings, Sarah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I'd agree with that. I mean, if you don't have if you don't have other products within a facility that that gives you access to ultimately go go and see a surgeon in that facility, then it, trade shows is absolutely the best way to do that. We also try and do you know direct to customer marketing where we'll you know we're able to access um, customer you know e email addresses and we'll send out communications on a new product, for instance. But yeah, trade shows is and and local either national or local trade shows um, is is often the best way to to get attention. Very good. Next question, how early can this process begin, specifically pre-FDA clearance 
uh, company will prepare for you shortly after clearance. So how, when can you approach uh, a hospital at the earliest period of time? You don't have FDA approval, certainly there's some regulatory limitations, but how, how open are you to seeing technology before it's cleared and is there value in doing that? On the acute side, the first thing that you're gonna be asked is does it have FDA clearance? So that's the very first question. One of the very first questions is gonna be asked. I think if you're a strategic partner, if you have um, relationships within that organization and you're a valued um, partner for an organization, you can start to have some of those conversations up front. Um, we all know that the runway to FDA approval can be a little bit lengthy. So you could say it's gonna be the end of the summer and it becomes the first part of the year of next year. Um, but I would say, for the most part, there is nothing that is gonna to go to a value analysis committee if it's not FDA approved. Right. Right, I agree. And typically, um, you know, if the surgeon's an inventor or a consultant for the product, they will be involved in that, not the facility. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's an avenue if there's a clinical study and the hospital's involved in the clinical study, that certainly might be a, a pathway. But before that, you're not getting a GPO contract. You're not getting a product. Mm -hmm. in, couldn't yeah. be into the hospital. Mm -hmm. okay. But it's also a huge conflict of interest. Um, yeah. So if we have a physician that, you know, has payments from a hospital, from an, um, a supplier or is an inventor or anything like that, uh, that becomes a conflict of interest. So we, um, committees will take a look at products like that, suggested like that, but they have to, um, um, they have to acknowledge the fact that they, they do have conflict of interest and they can't vote on things like that. So Makes sense. Right. yeah, so there's a lot of um, due diligence about around that, especially if they are uh, connected to the, to the supplier organization. Next question, what do you do if it is a new technology software or hardware that is designed for new applications affecting patient care for in-house and remote? Mm -hmm. Not, somebody, I'm not sure if I fully understand the question, but somebody, an expert on our panel, do you understand where that question is going and can we provide some guidance? So IT has to be involved if you're looking at the acute care side. Again, you start in value analysis, they'll draw in IT. Um, IT, I know typically in hospitals have an awful lot on their plates so where you are in the queue could be a lengthy process. Um, so it has to be something that's probably really, really innovative, can um, talk to other systems within an organization. There's a lot of variables for that, but it starts in drawing the IT folks. And if, if you are aware of that and you can have that starting conversations with value analysis, that's, that's really important because it's not something that can happen down the road once you're starting engaging in conversations. I would bring that up at the very forefront of your, or of your conversation. I also think there you talk about connectivity with sort of the hospital systems, whether it's Epic or otherwise, you need to start dealing with those partners first, right? Almost before you try to bring it into an institution. Really good. And for, um, the, and for the ASC, it would have to definitely be with the, um, the management company because overall we have the same flat platforms throughout all of our facilities. Mm. So we would not be able to do that uh, at a local. That's really good feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. Okay, so question, what about getting those first few cases done? How do you gain the traction and data on novel device that may not have breadth of data behind it, in which a larger institution or ASC wants to see for wide scale approvals, chicken or egg? So basically you have something novel, but you need data, with, but like you can't get into an institution because you don't have the data. So you're in that circle where you think you have something really good, but you need to be able to prove it. Thoughts on how to solve that problem? Pilot it for free at no Trial. cost. It's definitely Trial. a trial. Yeah. I would say also, if you are have a relationship with somebody in an academic or research um, organization, hospital organization, um, ask them to be, um, to, to, you know, to Chris and, and Paul's point, ask them to, to, to help trial, ask them to be, um, you know, champions of a study. And, and that can go a long way because it, um, a lot of organizations that do do research uh, as part of their academia, 
they're really happy to do that. They're very happy to do that if they believe that it's a good solid product. So again, make sure you have a lot of good information for them, what the potential outcomes are and have a trusted relationship with somebody in that organization to be able to help you through that. Really well And then said. they become a reference for you for other organizations that um, they can go to a peer-to-peer -peer discussion on, you know, I understand this device, um, but what was your experience with it? Well said. And I, I think on those, it's really, you're just gonna almost have to do a post-approval trial. It could be a limited one, know what your endpoints are, but you need to gather that data ultimately in some fashion that's controlled mm -hmm. so you can get the, uh, so you can, it will resonate with the hospital groups. So uh, yeah, I think that even though you have approval, if you don't have the data, you have to have some type of clinical trial that's controlled. Maybe it's a little more cost-effective. So what is the committee's opinion and feeling around validated FDA approved with RTC, RCT outcomes, digital therapeutics, which are very similar to medical devices. Do you feel doctors will prescribe these digital apps? Are the market launch processes the same? Are we, I think we're talking about patient engagement apps, PT apps, you know. Well, I have a quite a, a lot of experience with that. Um, as Paul is shaking her head, um, you know, <laughs> Again, it's not easy for the patients to navigate this. Um, it's very difficult and you have to have staff to support those patients or it, will, it won't work. And the, the market's getting saturated with those kind of uh, products. And I'm not too sure, sorry, Paula, I'm not no, too sure okay. how long patients you, I mean, there's some data out there that it drops off substantially engagement from patients after two weeks post-op from the orthopedic side. I don't know about other, um, specialties. For us here okay. at the Navy Yard, we can, we had one for pain management. And um, again, it started out really strong, but needed a lot of um, support from the internal um, healthcare providers. And now it's gone. It fell off. Patients weren't utilizing. So, I th right. I don't think, you know, there's a lot of patients, you know, the doctors make Jokes. Yeah, I guess my patient with the flip phone. I don't think we understand the socioeconomic status of people sometimes. I mean, it's not all like us sitting here with the best iPhone. Some patients just aren't tech savvy. That's our biggest complaint from patients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, is the call point still the surgeon physician hospital? Because, you know, you hear, I, I like this feedback. You hear how everything's going digital. Right, your ability to monitor patients remotely, be you know, it's a more efficient way to move forward. But if the patient doesn't have somewhat of the the understand the system and how it's utilized, if they don't utilize it, then you're not going to get the benefit from it. So, are you seeing the benefit of this digital revolution we are and remote patient care? Not. I mean, yeah. it's hard to tell because it's industry sponsored, mm -hmm. right? So if it's if it's us doing it, I mean, we've done some. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if there is any outcomes to show it's any different. There's pros, there's studies for it and studies against it, so. Okay. Next question, what is a reasonable timeline to use for planning purposes to get some traction with providers? What are best practices to avoid delays? So for planning, we talk about value analysis committee, you have an improved product. What is a reasonable time frame? as they start to put together their financial budgets for commercial launch and success. Maybe we'll start with Sarah, since I imagine you do that from time to time. <laughs> yeah, yes, um, and, and it's, it's in, in order to try and speed it up as much as possible, we just need to, to support, especially the physicians, support them as much as possible through the process, giving them the information, helping, you know, we spoke about, they need to you know, submit the initial request it's helping them prepare that request. So just making it as easy as possible for everyone involved, um, kind of hand feeding them the information. If you just have a conversation and then go, cool, go away, please advocate this for me and, and put it forward, it's, it's not gonna go anywhere. You've got to literally kind of spoon feed all the information, make it super easy for them so they can just press send and get it over. And what do you think is the reasonable time frame from I'm launching a product, I'm going to a value analysis, I'm identifying physicians that'll support us, going to go to a value analysis committee i'm going to get approval and now i'm going to launch the or i'm going to get the product into the market is 
what time frame would you put on there reasonably? <laughs> that, that's a good, a, uh, not an easy answer. It's completely varied, facility to facility. I mean, sometimes we look at a week, sometimes it's 18 months. Like, it, yeah. especially since COVID, it's, it's even longer, particularly in acute care. So it's, I mean, it's, it's, when we're looking at a new product and trying to get a feel for that, it's the same thing. Like you've got to understand what the process is, ask questions. What what is the current time frame we're looking at? And from our side, we try and prioritize that. Because again, you know, we we need to um, have some quick wins, and we're not going to get that if it's going to take eighteen months, two years for an approval. So we we try and understand that early on. But there's there's no one answer for that. It varies completely facility to facility. So Jefferson, what's a quick time? What boy yeah. that happened quickly? Did that happen? Took a year? Like what's the the average? So for me, it's not that long, Sarah, yeah. <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, I if a physician and I have everything completed, and if this is an initiative that will make a it's a big changer for the patient as well as the surgeon satisfaction, I will definitely move that process probably in beginning to end probably three months. Yeah, I think the larger the organization, the more, more difficult. So mm -hmm. if you go to Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson University, the university totally campus, that's going to take a long, long time, yeah. right? Paul is going to be very efficient, quick, you know. Yeah, I think on average on the acute care side, once a new product request is formalized, there could be four to six weeks to even get all the information before it even gets onto a committee agenda. And then you've got the committee agenda and then there's decisions on, I mean, if the physician doesn't show up to present it, it goes on to the following month. If he doesn't show up the second time, it goes on the third month. And then we typically say three strikes and you're out. So it could fall into a black hole right away and nobody knows. Um, on the positive side, you know, it could go into evaluation. Well, the decision is made by the clinicians. How long is this evaluation? That can be until we use, you know, 10 devices, or it could be, we're gonna look at six weeks or it could be three months. And then who's maintaining that evaluation? Who's providing the information back? Um, how formalizes their process for evaluations? Then it has to come back to the committee for final approval. Then it has to get into their item master and it has to, um, there could be products that have to be weaned through before they can even purchase a new product if it's a conversion to a different product. Um, so I know I'm adding weeks and months to this discussion um, because it is, it can be. And I've seen where, you know, decisions are made and products are six, nine, almost a year out before they're even purchased and brought in. Others on a much quicker basis, if it's truly a new product, um, there's nothing like in the organization and it can be something that can be a little quicker runway. So six months, nine months, a year, that's a reasonable period of time within, you know, mm -hmm. the, the minimum of six months, unless it's something truly technologically novel that you could accelerate the process. Yeah, it can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I think this one will start with you. Does the inventory surgery centers also have at-risk contracts with payers? Are they equally incentivized to avoid the complications? <sighs> I can answer that as yes and no, depending on um, the particular case. Um, but yes, um, yes. You do have ASCA, okay. Yeah. Um, um, I can answer for the practice. The, yeah. we, hold, we are at risk for many, many different payer contracts. Yeah. Um, definitely. We really were aggressive with that about eight years ago. And, you know, Paul, our partners, especially the ones we have joint ventures with, Centers are very involved in that. Okay. Final question I see here is what if the hospital itself has an equity interest in the company? Is that a conflict for selling to the hospital? So the hospital has an equity interest in the company that's actually providing the product. Is that just a one? Do you guys see that very often? And then number two, <clears throat> just no. disclosure or are they precluded? Oh, Deborah? So I don't, oh, sorry. oh, sorry, go ahead, Deborah. Okay. No, go ahead, Chris, you started, go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't see that where the hospital has, no. you know, maybe physical therapy, but that's all you can, as long as you disclose the physician, I know from us, we, the physicians do have mm -hmm. conflicts and it's mm -hmm. not bad, it's just a conflict. You have to disclose it, you have to disclose, we have to sign disclosure forms. Mm -hmm. We have a conflict of interest uh, statement we have to sign all of us, including the physicians. 
and you have to let the patients know, especially if you're an inventor of the implant and they're putting that implant in, you have to let the patients know. So compliance is pretty tight with those kind of sorts of issues. Yeah, I've never seen that situation with a hospital, but to Chris's point, it can happen on the provider side. At the beginning of every value analysis committee meeting, there's usually um, information that um, speaks to not a uh, conflict of interest. And anyone that's sitting in the committee meeting, if there is anything on the agenda that is producing conflict of interest, you need to disclose that. Typically, most hospitals in their compliance department, risk management, uh, physicians are signing um, a conflict of interest documents every year. So it's just something yeah. that has to be done. Um, but I, I haven't ever seen that. I don't think yeah. that that occurs, but maybe I just haven't seen it. Interesting. I think we addressed all the questions. So maybe I'll end. We have seven minutes left. If I just ask the question to panel, if there's one thing that a small company should do to be successful in bringing their product to the market, what's the one thing you just make sure you have to do this right? Any thoughts on that? And then we'll, we'll end this session. I would say just know your organization. Uh, yeah. Know who you need to go to to speak to. And we've talked about that. Be aware of that. Just don't think that you can walk in, you know, go to a department, speak to somebody on the floor. You have to know the right person to go to. Otherwise, it's going to be a futile um, search for you and um, experience for you. And it's going to make things a lot easier if you go to the right person out of the gate. I can definitely piggyback on Deborah, mm -hmm. knowing and building a relationship with your materials manager mm -hmm. and knowing the um, process. Don't skip her. Um, <laughs> that's, yeah, if you skip her and go directly to the surgeon and the surgeon wants to start something with a brand new product, you have just <laughs> um, made a bad friend. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's very true. Yeah, I'd, I'd say from my side, it's, it's having a very strong value proposition um, before you approach. Be very, very clear. What, what is the value you're offering to the facility, to the, the physician, and, and make sure that there is a very strong um, cost benefit. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's well said. I think also don't oversell the product. You know, don't send me, Paula and Deborah, like a thousand emails a week. That's another, you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm being honest. Like, you really just. Besides everything else we said, you know. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Good. Well, I think at this point, uh, I thank the panel for all the, the insights we provided everybody. And then uh, I think I'll, I'll turn it back over. Oh, oh I can... you. <laughs> Hello? See, it's the mute button. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It's our morning of technology. So thank you again, Charles, uh, excellent moderator, and to all of our panelists for such a great conversation today. Um, as always, we also want to thank our sponsors, Baker Tilly, Dwayne Morris, Fox Rothschild, and the Science Center. As we know, the support of all of our sponsors helps us to put together uh, panels like this and present these programs. And thank you to our audience for such great questions. Uh, Want to remind a few of you, um, as you're looking at PAC's upcoming events, we do have coming up on March 30th, our Femtech event, where we do a Femtech series. We encourage all of you to check out the PAC's website to see the information for that event. Also, one of PAC's signature events, Forum, is quickly coming up. It will be held on May 23rd, and its title is Embracing Volatility AI in Technology, Talent, and, and the Planet. And I'm sorry, that is May 3rd uh, from 8 to 4 p.m. at Penn State Great Valley. Uh, so again, we on the slides you'll see, and we hope all of you will look to join us for some of those programs. Again, we want to show you the PAC team, uh, Dean Miller, who Dean had to step away, but you know he was great to open this morning. Heidi Franklin, who is our normal director of uh, events and partnerships, who is out on maternity leave and should be returning to us shortly, and Kim Tuskai, our director of membership. And for those of you who didn't know, I'm Charmaine Roundtree, the new director of member success for the PAC team. If you have any questions about getting engaged, please feel free to reach out to me. So again, thank you all for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you again soon.